Com. Tonight on Talking Politics, GBH News' interview with New Boston City Council President Ruth C. Louis-Jean. She's the first ever Haitian American to hold that post. Plus, a look at the ballot questions that are headed for a vote in November, possibly. But first, Joe Biden will not be on the ballot in the New Hampshire primary, but that is not stopping his supporters from campaigning for him to win the state. The president opted out of New Hampshire after Democrats scheduled their contest first in that state, flouting Democratic National Committee plans to make South Carolina's primary the first in the nation. But now a group of Biden supporters are calling on New Hampshire voters to write his name on the ballot anyway. Among them, Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey, who headlined a conference call for Biden supporters just Thursday night. So will this strategy work? Or is New Hampshire a golden opportunity for Biden's challengers? I'm joined by one of the people organizing the writing campaign here in Massachusetts, Joe Cayazzo, and by Christopher Galdieri, professor of politics at St. Anselm College. Thank you both for being here. Great to be here. Uh, so, Joe, Glad you've worked for a bunch of presidential campaigns in the past. You organized this conference call that took place uh, the night before you and I are talking right now. What specifically is it that you and other people who are working on this in Massachusetts are trying to get people from Massachusetts to go up to New Hampshire to do? So there's an incredible amount of enthusiasm for the president throughout the country. I think this, I think the level of enthusiasm is often incredibly underreported. And we've seen this come to fruition with events like last night. Within the first minutes of our call to organize to help the efforts up in New Hampshire, we hit the capacity limit on our Zoom that we had to go, um, you know, that we had to go and increase. So does that mean you had a couple hundred people from Massachusetts trying we, to weigh in? We had well over a hundred people okay. on this call. Okay. It, so people, oh, so uh, not to not to uh, oversteer you here, but so sure. people are, you say, interested, enthusiastic about the president. What ideally will Maura Healy and you and all the other people who are part of this call, what will you be doing in the run-up to Election Day or maybe on Election Day itself? Sure. So, you know, our first number one priority is to fold all this, you know, major, uh, um, you know, all this major um, enthusiasm and energy for Joe Biden into the existing effort that's happening up in New Hampshire. Right. The all-volunteer leadership there is just absolutely superb. They've put together a crystal clear and concise game plan to help folks uh, to help folks really go and understand how to write in Joe Biden's name on the primary day. So then I assume they'll be educating them beforehand. I've looked at their website, yes. writeinbiden.com, I believe. Yes. Uh, and then on the day itself, Correct. people will also be up there. Correct. Right, saying, Correct. hey, make sure to write in Biden. Democracy Absolutely. is at stake. That's the, the argument, correct? Yeah, yeah. Look, you know, and every single time President Trump, former President Trump, op you know, every time he goes and opens his mouth, it becomes crystal clear that full democracy is at stake here. And this is an incredibly important election. The stakes have never been higher. I understand that every four years, everybody says this is the most important election of your life. But in this case, this is absolutely true. And voters understand that, as do the activists. Let me get Chris in here. Uh, Chris, is it fair to say that Joe and his colleagues here in Massachusetts, also people working on this campaign in New Hampshire, are trying to solve a problem that Biden created for himself? Because this DNC plan to demote New Hampshire to give South Carolina the first primary in this election cycle, with New Hampshire and some other states going later, that came from Biden himself, right? Uh, that's right. And um, I think, you know, this is the sort of thing that was pretty much an unforced error on the part of the president's campaign, uh, simply because, you know, New Hampshire um, is a swing state. It is a state where in 2012, uh, then President Obama in 2020, Donald Trump, uh, put tons of effort into the state, into the primary, so that they could get a running start on organizing in the state for the fall campaign. Uh, this sort of standoff between uh, New Hampshire Democrats and the state government on the one hand and the DNC on the other has you know, really forced the president's campaign to just sort of be in idle mode. Uh, um, while the while the primary is gearing up, and I think um, you know it, it's a missed opportunity for them. And the reason we're here talking about a writing campaign and whether it can succeed and that sort of thing is really um, the result of that decision. 
Well, let me ask you about whether it can succeed, and then we'll go back to you, Joe. But I know that uh, your colleague, Neil Levesque, at St. Anselm did some polling recently on the plans that people have when it comes to, okay, if, if the primary were today, what would you do? And I think we can pull up a graphic. The big takeaway is that the poll, which was conducted in December, shows that only 50% of people uh, who are likely primary voters in New Hampshire, uh, likely Democratic primary voters, say that they would plan to write in Biden. Uh, a big chunk aren't sure what they're going to do. Then there's a smaller number that are interested in Dean Phillips and Marianne Williamson. So for me, that raises the question, can Joe and his like-minded colleagues get people to write in the president? What do you think? Do you think 50% uh, is where the president's going to land, or can they get that number up to a more respectable level? Yeah, I think the big challenge for this write-in effort is going to simply be getting people to turn out in the first place. Um, this is a standalone primary. The only thing on the ballot is the presidential nomination. So you don't have people who would be otherwise coming out to vote in a, in a primary for Senate or governor or some other office like that. Uh, so you're asking people to get up on a potentially snowy January morning, trudge to the polls, and then fill in a circle and write in the guy who didn't file because his plan to get rid of the first in the nation status for New Hampshire um, didn't quite come to fruition. Um, so I, you know, I think uh, I don't expect the president to lose this primary. Um, I would be extraordinarily surprised if Williamson and Phillips um, pulled much better than those numbers showed. But I think you know that big gray chunk of not sure people mm -hmm. um, is not just they're not sure if they're going to write in Biden. I think they're not sure if they're going to uh, make time to go to the polls um, uh, on January 23rd. Joe Caazzo, what would a uh, what would a win for Biden, not just in terms of you know getting more votes than the other candidates, which it seems likely he's going to do, but in terms of getting a percentage of the vote, what what would a win look like? Sure, as so, you anticipate the sure. situation. Sure. Look, you know, I think you know at the start here, polls go up and polls go down. They're simply a snapshot in time. Something extraordinarily wonderful happened this morning. More people in this country woke up and went to work than ever before. The economy added 216,000 jobs in the month of December. Seniors pay less for prescription drugs today than, than they did before the president took office, and inflation is well under control. I th right, and this, is, and this is all simply because of the leadership of President Biden. I think when you look at this race, voters are much more cognizant of what's at stake. You know, trying to guess, you know, what's a win, what's not a win. 50 plus one is all that it takes to be, you know, to be victorious on that day. Uh, let's take a look at the messaging coming from the two candidates who you're trying to work against, the two candidates that uh, you said, Chris, earlier, you don't see uh, getting a ton more support than they're currently getting in that, that poll done by your colleague, Neil Levesque. Let's look first at how Dean Phillips the congressman from Minnesota is pitching himself. Then we'll take a look at Marianne Williamson, who's a little more familiar maybe to people since she ran uh, a couple cycles ago. Things that were affordable are no longer. Mortgage rates are going up. Fuel is too expensive. Food is too expensive. People can't afford childcare. And I'm on a mission now to do two things, to become president of the United States, to change this incredibly destructive system right now. And I'm also now on a mission to expose the truth about what is happening in our politics. The Florida Democratic Party, which is unbelievable I'm even saying these words, decided they would not have a presidential primary. They just said Joe Biden's the winner. The destruction of democracy is not unique to the right. It is happening in front of our eyes right here in your state and it's happening in Florida right now. It's time for change, it's time for a new generation. As Franklin Roosevelt said during the, during the Great Depression, he says it has become clear to me we must become radical for a, at least a generation. But radical is not a word that we should fear. The Declaration of Independence is radical. The radicalism that we should fear is the radicalism of the last 50 years. It is radical that we have allowed corporate forces to dominate and tyrannize the American people the way we have. So there we have the two best known, there's other people on the ballot, but the two best known challengers. Uh, Chris, what is it that Phillips and Williamson are not doing that perhaps they could do to be more viable than they seem to be? Or is there nothing, really? Are they just destined to be fringy candidates, given the unusual nature of this particular primary? Yeah, I think, you know, 
Challenging a sitting president in your own party's primary is always an uphill battle. Um, with very few exceptions, um, it's generally something of a fool's errand. Um, and that's not even necessarily a reflection on the challengers themselves. But uh, usually somebody who has gotten themselves elected president uh, means they've gotten nominated before, and they usually did that for a reason. Um, and I don't really think that um, Phillips or Williamson have really you know, articulated a clear reason that should be persuasive to Democrats. Um, you know, one of the things that struck me about that uh, Dean Phillips clip is that he manages to both um, include some criticism that you expect to come from Biden's left and some uh, that sound very similar to things that people are saying on Biden's right. And I'm not sure either of those has a huge constituency in uh, Democratic primaries. That does seem like a tricky balance to strike, right? Trying to have it both ways and trying to attract people who are voting in the Democratic primary as you come at the sitting president from both angles. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, I think you're gonna get the last word here. Chris mentioned earlier that New Hampshire is a swing state. So there's obviously, there's this primary, you want a strong outcome for the president, but then there's the question of who carries the state in November. Are you worried that the president's approach to this primary cycle, the fact that you're needing to pitch him as a writing candidate, are you worried that it's gonna make it harder for him to carry the state in November and could end up potentially being decisive if it's a razor close election? Look, you know, I think at the end of the day, we should take nothing for granted and we should make every effort to talk to voters about why it's super important to vote for Joe Biden for a second term. I ultimately don't think the intra-party politics will go and weigh in in the calculus of you know uh, of voters as they go and make their decision. The state of New Hampshire is an absolutely wonderful place. Voters value their ballot. In yeah, they love it. Oh, oh God, yeah. And look, I think they do their homework. And I think that when you do your homework, and I think that when you step back and you look at the you know field the candidates, it becomes crystal clear that Joe Biden is the best person to lead our country for four more years. You know, when you talk about uh, people up there doing their homework, I, I found myself imagining talking to voters, and I swear I could go up there today and I could find someone who told me that they still hadn't heard enough from President Biden or former President Trump. It's it's a classic New Hampshire approach. Well, we still need to hear a little more from the candidates. We're still kicking the tires. Chris Galdieri and Joe Caiazzo, thank you for talking this very interesting and complicated situation through. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Next up, the state's convoluted process for putting ballot questions before voters hit another key procedural moment this week. Secretary of State Bill Galvin announced that supporters of seven proposed laws had gathered enough signatures to send their proposals to the legislature, which can now legislate on the issues in question or just take a pass, in which case those proposed laws will likely go before voters come November, but not definitely. Joining me to discuss the ideas that made the cut and what, if anything, the House and Senate are likely to do next is Katie Lannon. She covers the State House for GBH News. Katie, thanks for being here, and good to see you as always. So when you and I talked about this last, in this space, there were dozens of these mm -hmm. questions kicking around. I mentioned that now there's, did I get that number right, seven? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no, okay. <laughs> All right, let's accentuate the positive. In what sense are there seven <laughs> questions? So there's, there's seven different um, petitions that Secretary of State Bill Galvin forwarded to the legislature this week. There's three more he's expected to certify okay. for a total of 10. And this is a lot of math, a lot of numbers um, for a lot of, you know, minutia here. But mm -hmm. five of the 10 questions are, are different versions of the same proposal. That's the question, proposed ballot question, that would reshape the relationship between, uh, redefine at least, the relationship between platforms like Uber and Lyft and their drivers. Mm -hmm. Uh, has to do with their employment status, their rights and benefits as, as workers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what are the other ones? So there is another rideshare driver's question uh, that comes kind of from the opposite angle. That's letting drivers unionize. Um, so apart from that, there's one that would legalize psychedelics. Yep. Uh, State Auditor Diana DiZoglio is hoping to be officially granted the power to audit the legislature, something top lawmakers have resisted. There is a bid to scrap uh, the use of the MCAS test as a graduation requirement yeah, for high that's schoolers. Yeah, really an interesting that's one. That's a hot high one. Stakes. And there is a, a bid to eliminate the lower wa minimum wage for tipped workers. That's right. I think that's everything. I was not counting. I wasn't counting. I should have been counting <laughs> my fingers since you had the hard job and I had the easy one. But I, I think we've got 
I think we've got everything there. Hopefully we're right. I'm sure we'll hear from people if we don't. And just another reminder on process. I mentioned this in the intro, but so now that these, these seven to 10 <laughs> questions are either have advanced or are likely to advance, they go to the legislature, which gets a chance to act on these topics. And then if the legislature does not act on them, does not legislate on these questions, they will probably, but not necessarily, be on the ballot in November, right? What could derail them? Let's say the legislature doesn't act on any of these. What could mm -hmm. keep them from getting on the ballot? So I should note to you off the top that the app-based driver's uh, employment status question, not all five of those are, are going to end up before voters. It's not that you're going to be deciding the, the minutia of which version of benefits they'd get. Um, that campaign will put forward one of those okay. questions, likely. So that's one way it'll get winnowed. There will be, there is another signature gathering threshold. They have to get more than 12,000 additional voter signatures mm -hmm. uh, over the summer. To Easier advance. than the one they just hit. Yeah, it's a much a, lower lift. Not a slam dunk. Exactly. Um, and you know, a campaign might decide to drop it, that they're no longer interested in pursuing it because of other national or state policy developments. Mm -hmm. um, you know, anything can happen politically in a matter of months. When you talk about a campaign potentially dropping it, one thing that I've been interested in in this cycle, maybe it always happens, but I've just noticed it in this cycle, is that there's often a split between activists who, who like a particular idea and principle on whether the best way to achieve it uh, best way to make a new law is to put it before voters as a ballot question or to have the legislature take action. We saw that with State Rep Mike Connolly's failed push to get rent control on the ballot. And now we're seeing it with this um, legalization of psychedelics question that you talked about as well. There are people who like that idea who want mm -hmm. it to go to voters and people who don't want it to go to voters. Why might it be preferable, if you have a big new idea, why might it be preferable to go through the legislature as opposed to the public? So the, the thing is, when you have a ballot question, it's a, it's a yes or no vote um, in your you know, polling booth or your vote by mail ballot. Voters can't amend the proposal that's before them. So if, if people like the idea broadly of say legalizing psychedelics, but don't care for this one particular approach that's mm -hmm. set out in the question, that's the dynamic here, right? There's a, a DC based group that's done work nationally on this issue yep. that's behind the ballot question. And there's a local advocacy group that's been taking more of a grassroots approach uh, with yeah. decriminalization measures locally that they've been pushing. And they, they want they've been wary of the potential costs from a, a regulatory heavy approach. Mm -hmm, they've got mm -hmm. a rally planned for next week, kind of pushing back against what they say is a, a corporatization uh, m movement, really, so. You know, that's interesting because, yeah, it, it, as, you, as you make that point, it, you're, you're highlighting the fact that if you are opposed to something, it's easier to oppose it if you say, look, at the, this is a national group coming in, they're trying to do this in 10 other states, for example, mm -hmm. um, they're not attuned to the particular uh, realities that we have to think about here in Massachusetts. It's too broad brush, and that's a nice argument to be able to make against a ballot question. Sure, yeah. Even if you, you like the, the principles, you might want to go about it a different way yeah. that you know people who have been doing the work here for a long time are focused on. Okay, so we've got about a minute and a half for you to answer this question. Of these issues that are going to be floating around, which ones is the legislature most likely to act on by the end of April, right? They don't have a ton of time here. Right. They, they don't have, they have until the end of April to pass it on their own. Um, sometimes you can see negotiations with the campaign to maybe drop a question in lieu of something else, mm -hmm. uh, go on longer. That's what happened with the grand bargain uh, a few years ago that oh, knocked right. off several ballot questions. Um, yeah, but, I'd love to model one piece like Exactly. But, you know, I think the, the driver stat employment status question is one that because there's two different proposals with two different goals, that that's one that's maybe ripe for a, a legislative compromise, of mm -hmm. course. Also, this is an issue that the legislature has had a chance to act on for years now. Uh, and, and hasn't. Yeah, it seems like it's been floating around forever. You mentioned that, that grand bargain from a few years back yes. when all these issues that were maybe going to be on the ballot were tied together legislatively and disposed of that way. Could we see something similar where you've got, you know, legalization of psychedelics and the status of rideshare drivers and one of the many things that you named earlier that I'm now forgetting, <laughs> where, where all these things that don't necessarily go together are in fact cobbled together in one big omnibus piece of legislation. Well, what happened in, I think it was 2018, a lot of those 
had to deal with labor and the retail sector. It was yeah. a sales tax question, paid family leave, yep. uh, minimum wage, and um, phasing out time and a half on holidays. Mm -hmm. So those involved a lot of the same interest groups. Here you have a much broader array of uh, interested parties. I don't want to rule anything out because, like I said, anything can happen in a matter of months. But it's less intuitive. Yeah, it'd together. be harder to cobble something together, I think, that satisfied everyone. All right, thank you for this overview. I learned a ton, and now it kind of makes <laughs> sense where it did not before. Katie Landon, appreciate it. Thanks, Adam. Always good to talk to you. Finally tonight, it's a new year, and the Boston City Council has a new president, at-large councilor Ruthie Louis-Jean. The vote was unanimous and historic, making Louis Jean the first Haitian American to head up the council. She sat down with Crystal Haynes on Greater Boston earlier this week to talk about her vision for the job and some other matters. Here is a part of that conversation. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Crystal, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You're stepping in or you're coming in after what has been described as a tumultuous year on the council mm -hmm. with lots two of- Two years. Two, two years. years, there you go. <laughs> yeah, tum yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, do you feel like you need to come in and, and right the ship? Or what, what do you hope in terms of having more conversations across thoughts, across, you know, that we didn't necessarily see in the last two years? That's a great question. I mean, not all was lost, right? right. Especially the, the stories that are picked up are the ones that can get the most mm -hmm. um, click, yeah, clicks and, and attention, but it was a pretty fraught Yes. Um, two years. We did redistricting, which is always a politically tense process. We we're still coming out of COVID, which really presented some of that collegiality that um, usually builds a preventant, you know, help pro to block that from really, from really forming. We had some staff changeovers at the council level, and then, you know, other people running for different offices. All of that creates some tension. I'm hoping that we can return back to basics. Mm. Politics, you know, it can be a really hard place. It's a hard arena. Um, I, you know, my, I have an aunt who's a nun, and someone said to me, if you wanted, you know, it all to be one big family should have joined the convent. I checked with my aunt and she was like, there's politics here too. So, I mean, we're going to have political differences. Mm -hmm. We're a big city. Uh, we all, you know, might disagree on the pace of equality, the pace of progress. That's going to happen. But we can do that while still saying hi to each other as we walk down the hallway, while still not, not you know, trying to take each other down. I don't believe that, you know, I don't believe this in any way. If your uh, equation for success is dependent on taking someone else down, you should find a new job. You should mm. find a new industry. Like, it should not be dependent on on taking someone else down. You should shine in your own right and in your own glory. And that's what I try to do alongside my constituents as we build community and solve problems. And that's what I hope to do as city council president. Each of my new four colleagues, John Fitzgerald, Enrique Pepin, Henry Santana, Ben Weber, they all bring their unique talents, their unique humor, their background either as a family in public service or a newly arrived, you know, a recent immigrant who grew up in public housing, they each have their skills and talents and backgrounds, and I hope to help bring that out. Absolutely. You know, well I know you have an ambitious agenda in terms of what you want to get done as city council president, yes. housing yes. being one of them. We actually have some numbers here where the average monthly rent increase in Boston between July 2022 and July 2023 was really high. A one bedroom jumped from about 2250 to 2595, a two bedroom 2775 to 3150. This is it, it's becoming we've been saying it's a crisis, but it seems like it's reached a fever pitch. Pitch. It, it has. I think that's that's exactly un, exactly and unfortunately right. Mm -hmm. We are the second most expensive city to rent. It is there's such a high barrier, and 65 percent of our residents in Boston are renters. Mm -hmm. And so I care deeply about homeownership, making that a reality. Even how we can you know move some renters over to homeownership, but we also have to acknowledge that we have to take care of our renters, mm -hmm. which is why you know we are working on everything we can to make the cost of housing more affordable. Whether that's using city-owned land, um, making sure that you know we have a a city with a with a strong bond rating that we can be using to build more housing. The government can be in that game. The federal um, government has abdicated its responsibility, but I'm excited by new leadership at the Boston Housing Authority about what we can accomplish by putting our heads together. There's not going to be one thing that solves it. We have the real estate transfer fee bill on Beacon Hill that would create an additional pool of money for the construction of affordable housing, money that we are currently leaving on the table. We have the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, which would prevent displacement because it would allow 
tenants in buildings to purchase the building, which may sound impossible because if you're renting, how do you have the money to buy a whole building? Yeah. But that's where the work with nonprofit organizations come in, with community land trust, with nonprofit developers who care about uh, stability in communities and preventing displacement. And we, they do that in other cities, oh, major absolutely. cities as well, absolutely. with the tenants purchasing the exactly. building. Exactly, exactly. So, and we have to learn from other cities. We, you know, yeah. we have a rent stabilization bill that's before the state house that we worked uh, diligently on that wouldn't prevent rent increases, but would, you know, make it so that our wages, people's living wages aren't increasing by 50% a year. It's nowhere mm -hmm. near that. Yeah. But some people are seeing rent increases in that amount. And so we have to do something to try to attack that. There's so much, you know, looking at city owned land to see how we build more um, affordable units and properties. There's so many different things that we have to do to accomplish that goal. One of them we did last year, which was increasing if there's a developer who's building a property in Boston of 10 or more units, seven or more units now, increasing the a percentage of those units that have to be affordable mm -hmm. and also deepening that affordability, lowering the threshold at which people are eligible for those units because we know that oftentimes what is affordable for one isn't affordable for someone else. That's right. So trying to attempt to make it more to broader so that more people, especially people of color, working class families, are able to um, are able to apply and, and, and successfully uh, receive one of these affordable units. I also want to ask you something that has nothing to do with the city Council, okay. but everything to do with with concerns about DE and I in the state as a whole, and especially at Harvard, we mm. know that Claudine Gay, also Haitian American woman, yes. the first Haitian American Black woman in that position. Mm. I mean, a as someone who's also a first, what do you think about this situation? How does it make you feel to see her resign and and, and leave that position? Yeah. It was a I mean, and it can, it's a, such a point of pride for the Haitian community yeah. for her to be in that role. And I remember being at her inauguration, and I remember just being so proud as a Bostonian, as a Haitian, as a graduate of Harvard Law School and the Kennedy School. It was just um, amazing. And so I just honestly, I feel saddened and I mm. feel heartbroken. Um, the attorney general yesterday commended me of on becoming president of the Boston City Council. She was the first black woman to head the council and often first, you know, experience a number of challenges and setbacks and a lot of people trying to prevent that first from even happening. And so I commend uh, uh, Dr. Gay for being in the ring. Mm. Um, and we know that for, for women and for women of color, being in the ring is, uh, is an even harder and daunting task. Mm -hmm. But um, there is legacy even in an attempt. Mm. And so many people, especially in black and brown communities, because of um, histories and legacies of, of racism and exclusion, our legacies can often be found in the attempt. And there's value in that. And so I want to honor that for her. Ruth Z. Louis-Jean, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> You can catch the full interview with Boston City Council President Ruth C. Louis-Jean on the GBH News YouTube page. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week and tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics. And make sure to sign up for our politics newsletter. For now, thanks for watching and good night.